Welcome to tonight's reading. Alchemy of Light Working with the Primal Energies of Life by Llewellyn Vaughn Lee Chapter 2 The Light of the World O Light of Light Thy light illumines the people of heaven and enlightens the people of earth. O light of all light, thy light is praised by all light. Prayer attributed to Muhammad. A light to see by. We see this world around us through the light of our consciousness. Our eyes and other senses are the physical mechanism by which we perceive the world. But it is through our consciousness that we experience its colors and beauty and the richness of the experiences life offers us. Our experience of life expands as our consciousness expands. We have more light to see by, and our experience grows fuller, richer, deeper. When our consciousness is confined within the limited scope of our mind and ego, the world we experience is filled with the images we have created. We are conditioned to think that the world defined by these individual and collective images is the real world. This is the world we think we know. The world into which we are born and from which only death can free us. The world in which we struggle, suffer, and sometimes taste a fleeting happiness. And while spiritual texts may tell us that this world is an illusion, it appears very real to our senses and mind. It seems almost madness to assert that it is not the reality it appears to be in the light of our limited individual consciousness that is rooted in the mind and ego. But within the heart, of every human being there lies hidden another light which reveals a world beyond the one perceived by our ego consciousness. This is the light of the self which is a direct knowing of God. It is this light that draws us back to God that calls us on the search for truth and reveals the real nature of life. Then life and the soul speak to us and tell us about the journey of the soul, the journey back to the source. When this light within the heart is awakened, we begin to experience a whole different world, the shift from a world seen by just the light of the ego to a world seen by the light of the self can be either a subtle or a dramatic awakening. We might gradually sense something else present within ourselves and within the world, a quality of peace, love, light, or pure being. Or we could undergo a mind-shattering expansion of consciousness in which the ego is pushed aside by the power of the real or as in a Zen experience of Satori. We experience the world unveiled as it is, unmediated by any thought or concept. For each of us, this moment in which the light of the self comes into our world is unique, but it is an awakening to our real nature and the real nature of life. The world revealed by this light is the world we have always known, and yet it is completely new. The Light Within the World At the core of the world, there is also a light that belongs to God. 
This light carries the secret of his intention, of his hidden purpose. Where the light within the heart is direct knowing of God that calls us on the search for truth. The light within the world is a knowing of the divine purpose of his manifestation, of his revelation of himself in his world. The light within the world calls us to see this secret, to make it conscious that we may begin to see the world by the light of his divine intention. The light at the core of the world has always been present, but hidden, waiting to awaken, just as our own light lies hidden in our own heart until it is awakened. And just as there is a moment of grace in our individual life when the light of the self awakens in us, there also comes a moment in cosmic time when the light of the world awakens. On our individual journey, this awakening often happens at a time of despair. Our soul, desolate in a world without meaning, calls out and our divine light responds, revealing to us our divine nature which we had forgotten and bringing meaning, color, and life back to our world. So also does the light within the world awaken in response to humanity's cry of despair. The world today knows the meaning of desolation. What is sacred has been desecrated and denied. Something within the world and within the hearts of those who love the world and its creator has called out and the light within the world has responded. Those who recognize what is really happening to the world, who experience its suffering and sorrow, have reminded the divine of an ancient pledge not to let the spirit of the world die, not to let this desecration be so complete that nothing can be reborn. This is a real danger. There comes a moment when the cycle of self-destruction and forgetfulness begins to pollute the energies that can recreate life to such a degree that the sacred cannot be reborn. We have now reached that moment in the life cycle of our planet. Our ecological devastation and more significantly, our collective desecration of all that is sacred are polluting the spiritual energy of life itself. Through our self-centeredness, we are poisoning the spiritual lifeblood of the planet such that the situation has become almost irreversible. When the collective forgetfulness of humanity reaches a certain point, then humanity reverts to an earlier stage in its development. We see indications of this reversion already in our collective greed for material possessions that have no spiritual purpose, that do not really nourish us. We are reverting to a tribal self-preservation and our survival instinct is brought to bear not upon any real need itself, but upon our possessions, the accumulation and protection of which have become our goal. A fundamental spiritual purpose to life is being buried under this debris. Soon, it will be lost to our collective consciousness and humanity will have regressed to a less spiritually developed stage. The signs of this are all around us, especially in the West, but they are obscured by the glitter of our possessions, by the toys of our technological development. But what is the purpose of all this outer development if the music of the soul is lost, if the spiritual purpose of life is forgotten for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Working with the light of the whole. The awakening of the light of the world 
is an opportunity for us to reverse this cycle of forgetfulness and to remember why we are here. Through this light, we can redeem the world and all of humanity. Because the light of the world is the light of the whole of life, the whole planet, the whole of humanity. When the light of the world awakens in us, we can redeem what has been desecrated and empower the whole of humanity to take the next step in its evolution. Without this light, we cannot see where we are going or the work that needs to be done, nor can we be awake to the world that is really around us, the world of his divine purpose. We remain caught in our self-destructive dream of material progress. The souls of those who remember God have called out and the light of the world has responded. We have taken the first step. The collective may still be caught in its addiction to consumerism, but there is a growing network of individuals and groups who are working for the evolution of the whole. They have seen the abyss in front of us and recognized our responsibility for the planet. They have also glimpsed the opportunities within our present situation. Their work is to bring the light of the whole into our individual everyday life so that it can transform life. Only the light of the world, which is the light of the whole, can transform the world, just as only the light of the self can transform an individual. On our individual journey, we know that without this light there can be no real or lasting transformation. We have yet to fully realize how this also holds true for the whole world. In the transformation of an individual, one of the first steps is to create a body of light that is like a womb for our spiritual rebirth. Through our practices and devotions, our prayers, meditation, and aspiration, we create this body of light with our own life energy, which is why traditionally a period of introversion or brooding is needed for this stage of spiritual work. Energy that normally flows outward into life is circulated inwardly. This container needs to be strong enough to withstand any negative forces from the ego or the psyche that may try to interfere with our spiritual awakening. The body of the light is the container for the divine light that is given, which is the spark that creates the divine child within us. In the same way, individuals and groups have begun to create a container for working with the divine light of the world, a container created from the light of their own aspirations and service. This container is made of the connections between them. The container is the network that links them together. This is not simply an inner container for what will be given. That misunderstanding of the nature of the container limits the work that can be done. The network of light is itself part of the energy of transformation. The connections that are being made now are a necessary part of the process, but this is just a preliminary stage. The next step will be to infuse this container, this living network, with the light of the whole and see how it responds to see whether it can hold together, contain the higher forces of a spiritual awakening, and withstand the negative energies of the collective. In the transformation of an individual, this is often a crucial stage. Has the work of preparation, the inner work, created a container for real spiritual consciousness? If certain aspects of the inner work have not been done thoroughly, the individual can become inflated or psychologically or psychically unbalanced by the influx of divine energy. This moment in the transformation of an individual presents many dangers. 
With the light of the world, there will also be dangers. An individual participating in this work might not fully acknowledge that this light is for the whole and could take the light of the world for his own. Individuals or groups might try to use the light for their own purposes, even with good intentions, not recognizing or respecting the much bigger process in which they are participating. As the vibration of this light is very specifically designed for its real purpose, it only works properly within the container of the whole, as a part of the organic wholeness of life. If it is misused, it can become spiritually destructive. This energy is the whole of life, recreating itself from the highest level. It cannot be beneficially used for any other purpose. Real, cooperative work. But although the light of the world belongs to the whole of creation, it also has a direct relationship to the individual. This is part of the mystery of the individual as microcosm. When Christ said, quote, you are the light of the world, he was acknowledging this dimension within each individual human being. Our divine light is the light of the world, and our individual light relates directly to the light of the whole. This relationship of light to light belongs to the way that oneness works within the individual and within the world. The light within the individual and the light within the world are one light. A light that in calling to us also calls to itself, evokes itself, responds to itself. On our own mystical journey, we experience this mystery of light, calling to light. Light rises toward light and light comes down upon light and it is light upon light. Each time a light rises up from you, a light comes down toward you, and each time a flame rises from you, a corresponding flame comes down toward you. The light of our aspiration draws down the light of his love. Through this relationship, our light is nourished and grows until the substance of light becomes a whole in relation to what is of the same nature in heaven. Then it is the substance of light in heaven which yearns for you and is attracted by your light and it descends towards you. This is the secret of the mystical approach. When our light has grown in this way, it experiences its essential nature, that in truth, it is one light coming to meet itself. Just as in the esoteric mystery of, he loves them and they love him. Lover and beloved are one. Then the journey changes, no longer driven by effort, but carried by grace. On the journey of spiritual ascent, the relationship between the light of our aspiration, the light that rises up, and the higher light that comes down, makes the journey possible. We call to our beloved, and he comes to meet us. In the drama of the world, the light of our devotion and service calls to the light within creation. First. It reminds this divine light of its pledge to save the world. Then it has to welcome this light into a world covered in forgetfulness of its divine purpose. Just as we have to welcome the light of our own self into our individual world that has been shrouded for so long in our forgetfulness of our real nature. The work of the present time is to welcome his light back into the world 
And this is not the transcendent light of the inner mystical journey, but the light hidden at the core of creation. It is this light that is needed to transform our world because it is in essence the same light. There can be a direct communication between the light within the individual and the light of the world. A communication based upon oneness, not upon duality. We are used to communication based on duality, which often results in misunderstanding. As duality is a paradigm of separation and differences, a relationship based upon oneness is direct and dynamic. It functions within an altogether different paradigm that is based upon an understanding of the fundamental unity of all things and the natural cooperation that arises from it. The light of the world knows that we are one and works within this context. Through life's essential unity, it has direct access to all of life's interconnections, which are an expression of that unity. The light itself is that unity. Just as the light of our soul is present throughout our body and psychic, so is the light of the world present in every cell of creation, in every thought, and every dream. It is present in each atom and in all the connections between the atoms. It is a living network of light that sustains all of life. When we relate to this light within life, we relate directly to the whole of life. This is part of the power of the relationship of light to light. When our individual light relates to the world's light, which permeates everything in life, we have direct access to all of life's interconnections and to all of the archetypal structures that form life, that are the riverbeds through which the waters of life flow. We place ourselves at the very center of life, a center that is everywhere. In the relationship of light to light, Nothing is excluded because it is a relationship that belongs to oneness, to our essential unity and the unity of life. This relationship is not an idea, but a living reality that has the potential to bring about real change. Through this interchange, we can have a true co-creative relationship with life. We ourselves can live the mystery of one-handed basket weaving that Rumi celebrates in his story of a Sufi sheik who has had one of his hands cut off. A visitor who enters his hut without knocking sees the one-handed sheik weaving palm leaf baskets. It takes two hands to weave the visitor exclaims. But because the sheik has no fear of dismemberment or death, he has access to a divine hand that helps him. As he explains to his astonished visitor, when those anxious, self-protecting imaginations leave, the real cooperative work begins. When we step outside the self-protecting image of our separate self, we can directly participate in the work of the whole. The mystery of working together with the forces of creation and the light of the world. We do not yet realize the profound significance of this relationship of our individual self to the whole. The two lights need each other for this urgent work that needs to be done now in the world. Just as the light from above needs the light from below for the spiritual transformation of the individual. This relationship of light to light, the light of our individual consciousness to the light of the whole, is central to the mystery of the human being who is his secret. 
Man is my secret, and I am his secret. The light of the human being is the spiritual essence of God in the world. But only when we recognize this, when we acknowledge that our light belongs to God, can it awaken to its real potential, its power for transformation. This light can transform ourself and our world. But only when working in cooperation with a light that is beyond our individual consciousness. On the inner journey, this is the light from above. For the work in the world, it is the light at the core of creation. Without this external light, we remain caught within the limitations of our own self and nothing new can be born. Transformation is always a cooperative undertaking. Communicating with the light of the whole. What is the nature of this relationship of light to light, of our consciousness to the light of the world? How does this cooperation take place? For the mystic, it is always a relationship of love. Love is the basis of our existence, of our relationship to life and to God. Without love, no real relationship can take place and nothing can be born. Love directly connects us to the light of the world, which speaks to our heart. At the beginning, we experience this relationship as a simple awareness of the light of the world, a simple connection of light to light. But once we recognize it as the communion of love that it is, it opens into a more conscious awareness of our place within life and of how we can contribute to the whole. Each of us has a unique part to play, a unique contribution that our individual light can make. And we each need to take the step of learning how to live our light in the world and in relation to the whole. This communication is wonderfully simple. The light of the world is the whole, and so it encompasses in itself the particular way that our light can participate in its unfolding. It knows what we need to do. It speaks to our light as light to light. Within a relationship of oneness, where there is no danger of misunderstanding, it shows our light its place in creation. The light of each individual vibrates at a unique frequency, and it shows us how this frequency can function in relation to the whole. But our light is not a fixed or static entity. Life is alive. It is in continual flux. Nothing is static. The unfolding of the whole is a constantly changing, dynamic process. While it may follow certain inherent laws, for example, the law of least resistance, according to which life flows like water from the source, the organic nature of life depends upon change for its survival and its evolution, and we are a part of this change. In order to participate fully, our own light sometimes needs to adapt and change to reflect changes within the whole. Because the light of the whole includes our light, the knowledge of the adaptations we need to make along with help to do it is also a part of the communication from light to light. When we give our light to the light of the world, we give it the light of individual consciousness. We allow individual consciousness to be included in the light of the whole, and we help it in this process of dynamic change. Individual consciousness has a vital part to play as a catalyst in the evolution of the whole. The arrival of human consciousness on our planet speeded up life's evolution, releasing it from the laws of nature which change very slowly 
over millennia. Through our human consciousness, new forms, images, and ideas can come into being. Through us, the intelligence of the world can be more creative. Through our light, the light of the whole can evolve faster and more purposefully. In the communication of our individual light and the light of the world, both lights are quickened in both senses of the word. Yet, we have lost this direct relationship between our individual light and the light of life. The last era's focus on individualism fostered an image of consciousness as separate from the whole, a tool for imposing our dominance over others and over nature. We have almost forgotten that in older cultures, people viewed consciousness much differently in a context of the oneness and interconnectedness of the whole world of creation. This allowed them, for example, to use their consciousness to communicate with nature in a way we can now barely imagine. Robert Wolf, who was initiated by the same God in Malaysia, describes his experience with this earlier form, consciousness. Once, while walking a steep and very narrow trail, I had an almost disabling sinus headache. Each step pounded in my head. As I trudged up the steep trail, I looked up and saw a plant I did not know. Maybe 20 feet above me on the side of the cliff. As I looked at the plant, I knew what it would feel like, hairy, but not stinging, what it would smell like, aromatic. And I knew that if I could get even one leaf of that plant, crush it and put it in my nose, it would clear my sinuses. A friend reached up with a long stick and managed to break off a leaf of the plant. It felt as I knew it would, and it smelled as I knew it would. I put it in my nose. It cleared my sinuses as I knew it would. This knowing, which flows from the oneness and interconnectedness of the whole world of creation, was for Wolf an experience of awakening. It was as if, as he described it, a light was lit deep inside of me. If we are to regain a mutually sustaining relationship with life and the created world, we too need to reconnect with this natural knowing, with this direct relationship based upon oneness. Then the world can share with us not just the healing power of plants, but the wisdom we need for our future. It has a latent knowledge of how to heal much of its pollution and ecological imbalance. The earth has many other secrets waiting to be revealed. For example, how the deep rhythms of life affect the individual and how our consciousness can work in developing and changing the archetypal patterns of life. But it needs our conscious cooperation in order to communicate with us. The earth understands the pivotal role the consciousness of the individual has to play in its evolution. It needs us to cooperate with the energy that is coming from its core, with the light that is being awakened. Welcoming the light. As the light of the world begins now to awaken, our first task is to welcome it into the world. Simple as it seems, this is a very important step. We know in our own inner process the difference between an inner energy that is welcome into our life and one that is rejected. Rejected energy comes in through the shadow, often violently and destructively breaking into our conscious life. Energy that is accepted can be creatively integrated and give us new life. Its regenerative potential can flow with a minimum of resistance, 
so that life can once again recreate itself. In order to welcome it without evoking resistance, we will need to recognize that the energy of this awakened light, which is the energy of life itself, has a very different vibration from that of the patterns of our present existence and structures of consciousness. It belongs to the oneness of life rather than to patterns of separation, and it moves more quickly than our present thought forms. It is alive in a new way. It does not follow the accepted rules by which we have defined our surface life. And it also has a darkness and density because it carries the instinctual energy of life itself. It is not split into two, into light and dark, good and bad. It is. This energy is life, awake. We will need to be awake ourselves to be able to welcome in something so unfamiliar and new. This is a task for each of us individually. Collective consciousness cannot directly welcome what is new because by its very nature, the collective follows what is already defined. Individual consciousness does not need to be so constricted. Its nature is freer and more adaptable. It can change more quickly. This is particularly true of consciousness that has been trained by spiritual practices, not to identify, not to be attached, but to acknowledge the transitory nature of all appearances. This allows an individual consciousness to be present with what is new, what is coming into being. When it is truly welcome, when we bring this life energy into communion with our individual consciousness, the undefined energy of life can flow into forms that are most beneficial into images of life that support the whole of life, including both physical life and the life of the soul. It is essential in the next stage of our evolution that the forms into which life flows, the images of life, both benefit our physical existence and nourish the soul. The inner and outer worlds need to come together in a way that is mutually sustaining. There is no need for the inclusion of the soul to work to the detriment of the body, as the past era of duality has seemed to imply. We need not return to an era of physical deprivation, of hunger and disease. Life can be, as Yeats has it, a blossoming or dancing where the body is not bruised to pleasure soul. There is an inherent harmony in life that can bring the two into balance so that they each support and sustain the other. This is a central attribute of the newly awakening energy of life that is waiting for us to welcome it in. Our individual consciousness is needed in the creation of these new images that will support the whole of life. New images of life are born into our consciousness through the interaction of the energy awakening in the world and our individual consciousness. This is how it has always been at the dawn of a new era. The undifferentiated energy from the core of life needs our individual consciousness in order to create the new forms of living, the new ways of being. Those attuned to what is really happening can directly participate in this rebirth. On our individual journey, we learn to welcome new energy that comes from within and to help it creatively redefine our life. This often means giving up old patterns of behavior, old self images. It may mean changing a career or a relationship that inhibits our growth rather than allowing us to be nourished. As we welcome in this new life energy of the whole, we will need to prepare for changes on a much wider scale. At this time of global transition, many collective patterns will need to be left behind or transformed. But in keeping with the nature of the energy that is coming in, we will need to allow this change to come 
from an organic relationship to life and from an interaction of inner and outer. These changes cannot be imposed or forced. Enough damage has been done in the last centuries through the imposing of beliefs or patterns of behavior. Life needs to recreate itself through us. This is part of our responsibility as guardians of the planet. But in order to work with us, life needs our individual consciousness to have already made the step from separation to oneness. It requires a consciousness that knows it is part of the whole and does not isolate or protect itself from the prospect of change. The contracting dynamic of self-protection easily distorts what is new into images that threaten its preservation. It does not allow new energy to flow. Once we acknowledge that we are a part of life, that our spark of consciousness is part of the consciousness of the whole of life, then we can be present in a new way where life is coming into being. The light of the world can communicate directly with our individual consciousness and together they can recreate life. Patterns of resistance. What is it that holds us back from this simple acknowledgement that we belong to the whole of life? Is it too threatening to our belief and our own individuality to know that we can directly participate in the recreation of life? Would we rather go on blaming others or corporations or governments for our present predicament? Is such real democracy too demanding or is it our simple fear of leaving behind what we know that makes us choose to stay with our own negative dynamics, our self-destructive patterns, just because they are familiar. We constrict ourselves for so many reasons and justify ourselves with excuses or intentions for change that we never get around to living. Life is dying and it needs our light in order to recreate itself. Without the participation of individual consciousness, the images of life as a self-sustaining whole that are needed for its survival cannot be born in time to allow it to recreate itself in the light of its real purpose. On its own, nature evolves too slowly, and the cycles of nature Centuries or millennia of devastation or stagnation in which life forms contract usually follow upon a major disaster or imbalance. The ways that human consciousness in the past has aided in the evolution of life are not adapted to the urgent task that faces us now. Human consciousness needs to make a shift into a global dimension as individuals we need to become conscious of the relationship of our light to the light of the whole and to discover our own direct access to it through the oneness of which we are each a manifestation. We need to begin to take individual responsibility for the light of the planet if the energy that can take us to the next stage of evolution is to be made available to life. This new energy can only be fully born through a relationship of oneness to oneness, of microcosm to macrocosm. The conscious recognition that we each are the life and light of the whole is the catalyst that is needed to make this happen. This conscious recognition is like a spark between the individual and the whole that can ignite the light of the whole, awaken to its higher purpose. Without this spark, the evolution of the whole will continue. The patterns of globalization are already in place, but there will be no conscious awareness of its real purpose. Instead of moving to the next level of its evolution, life could move backward into another dark age 
in which the soul of humanity goes into eclipse. We can continue in our present materialistic self-indulgence for a few more decades. We can continue to develop new technologies for our pleasure and profit. But without the spark between our individual light and the light of the whole, essentially nothing new can be born. Our collective existence will function more and more on a purely physical level as the images and symbols that are needed to creatively connect the worlds continue to go unformed, our soul will become more and more divorced from our physical life. We will collectively forget why we are here. One of the secrets of life is that it always recreates itself in the simplest way. Life is a living organism of which we are a part. The center of our being is at the center of life. In our thoughts and imaginings, we may perceive ourselves as alienated or at the periphery of life, but that is only another illusion. Life is an expression of the divine, and we each hold the light of the divine within our own heart. Part of spiritual practice is to affirm this inner reality with each and every breath, and so to affirm the connection of love that is at the core of life. If we forget this, if we lose our conscious affirmation of the simple essence that is the divine presence within ourselves and within life, it is this simple essence that is recreating itself, the divine being reborn in a new way within ourself and within life. The work of the lover is to be fully present at this mystery of rebirth, to be alive to his need to use us as he makes himself known to himself in a new way. At first, all that is needed is for us to be aware that our light is part of the light of the whole and to allow a relationship between the two lights, to welcome the light of the whole into the world. Through this relationship, we will be drawn into a creative network of light that supports the creation of new forms and the energy that is needed to sustain them. How this relationship of light to light will develop depends upon a number of factors, such as how much resistance from the collective it encounters, and how hard the collective and its old ways will fight for their survival. Certain constellations of worldly power can adapt to accommodate what is being born, while others are too constricted to allow any new light to enter. Some negative patterns can be worked around, while others have to be directly confronted. We can be individually aligned with the forces of creation. This is the opportunity this moment in history offers us. We can bring our light into relationship with what is being born. It is a simple affirmation of our own power and the power of life. And there is a quality of joy in this. Once again, life is recreating itself and we are a part of this recreation. We are a part of the light of God being manifest in a new way.